Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm glad to be here. It's my first time in Finland, even though I've cooperated with scholars here, Avo Kostjainen here, 35 years ago intensively for a long time. So uh, I don't feel uh, altogether strange here. I'm enjoying being here. Uh, Thomas and I did not agree about our kind of starting sentences, but I can uh, begin exactly where he what he just talked about, connections between environment and migration and vice versa would be part of historical memory had not by conscious decision my mainstream historians focused almost solely on border territories and politics. Since the emergence of humankind, no binary opposition between ecology and resident or mobile social life ever existed. Retracing the connections is an in act of intellectual militancy because it brings common people's agency back into historical memory. Natural environments provided the frames for their lives, but they shaped them to arrange their daily lives and their children and their and their children's prospects for the future, their many distinct futures. I will begin my reflections with impacts of nature, climate, and geology included in long durée glacializations, short-term volcano eruptions, and middle-range century-long climate swings. Then, in a second approach, it will bring social hierarchies and power into the picture. Imperial political and imperial economic elites could deprive the vast majority of their, sub their subjects of equal access to natural resources and destroy nature while building empires. Thirdly, I will briefly turn to demographic expansion and use or overuse of landscapes. In conclusion, I will deal with human activities and micro impacts on nature and local climates. Combining the natural and the social misses a third aspect of collective humanities and individual humans, the spiritual. And I would like to say a few words about this. Men and women entered nature scapes, read them, through agency turned them into usable scapes, and to come to terms with powers beyond their influence created spiritual scapes. Spirituality depended on environment. Some created or felt influenced by mountain spirits, other by water goddesses. The languages and the empirical observations, as well as conceptualizations behind them, reflected natures. People in temperate zones designate flurry-type frozen rain as snow, a singular. Inuit have dozens of differentiating designations. Temperate zone dwellers have dozens or even hundreds of designations for birds. People in deserts uh, have only very few. Language is sh shaped in response to one environment may be misleading after migration to another. Mental scapes reflect observation and usages people could make of their environments. Fertile, <coughs> fertile riverine plains with fertilizing or damaging inundations, arid landscapes, so-called deserts, with webs of traversable routes and oases as stopping points. Mountains as seats or rostrums of higher powers or location of valuable ores. The trope desert was once applied to the North American prairies and in a cold and uninhabitable version to southern Siberia which has a mild climate. Narratives of one particular fusion of nature, humanity, and spirituality had one single god create the world's landscapes in six days of work. The storyteller's worlds exten extended from Palestine and Syria to the Nile Valley, to the Sinai Peninsula, to Mesopotamia and Anatolia, to plateaus like the Iranian and mountain ranges. Their creator, 
by the time they committed the story to writing had or had been morphed from female infertility by a gender neutral to male and domineering. The landscape seems to have been one of permanent mild summer, the temperatures warm since the first human beings were content with fig leaves as garments. Thus, this particular religion began with an idealized landscape, like the Buddhist one before. Buddha was born when his mother touched a branch of a beautiful tree. He became a migrant in search of enlightenment. Adam and Eve became expellees in landscapes to be tilled by hard work and be populated by giving painful birth. Paradise, Pairi Deza in Old Iranian, was human made, a walled garden, wall is important, a walled garden full of trees, fruits, flowers, fragrant scents, animals. Paradise was a space of spirituality and reflection of appropriated nature and, that's often forgotten, of deadly hunt, of power since only the rich could afford such enclosures. This Persian reign arranged in walled nature, Arabs adopted from, Normans, uh, from them, Normans in Sicily, who took captured fallow deer far away and created park landscapes in an island called England. Other migrants, self-designated Israelites, and most other people of the region adapted to deserts, transformed cedar woods into lumber, including beams for temples, and built urban dwellings out of clay. Nature and human beings and their spirituality have always been connected. I will now turn to the long durée glacializations. While it is easy to perceive temperate zones as arenas of human activity, this is more difficult for ice-covered regions or arid deserts. Scribes, chroniclers, and scholars do not live in the latter environments, and thus later narrators did not bother about them. Archaeologists, however, literally unearthed or de-iced empirical data, both ice age, or should we call it survival age for the people living there, and extremely hot environments show an ever-changing sequence of nature culture scapes of interactions between given perceived nature and human material and mental activity. During the last phase of the Worm Glacial in Europe, ending about 12,000 before our counting, humans had to make decisions, stay and come to terms with a changing ecology or migrate to follow retreating or advancing animals customarily hunted for nourishment. Non-adaptation in this case to stay with the nature they knew required migration. Life and survival were difficult and giving life through birth and keeping the newborn warm required additional ingenuity and in natural resources as well as spirituality based on female fertility. When, climbing warming when climate warming started, some followed big game like mammoth and kept their particular hunting culture. Others stayed and learned to hunt reindeer, which, which required different techniques, faster moves, spear throwing over larger distances, different hides and bones, and thus different bone needles to suit tents and clothing. Later fable tell us called these people cave men. Aside from the fact that men alone could not have propagated, caves merely served as air-conditioned, ice-free depositories of bones, tools, and body ornaments. The bones preserved in these caves also show us a major change in relations between humans and the animals around them. The very early bones show clearly that humans were the food of the carnivores of the time. And at some point in time, 
the bones show us this change that now the humans could, uh, in their turn, eat the predatory animals and kill them in time. In Northeast Asia, around 15,000 be before our counting, humans moved through Beringia to the, thanks to glacier lowered water levels, still connected northwestern tip of the Americas. They scouted and discovered the single, due to wind and climate, ice-free southward corridor east of the Rocky Mountain chain. In spaces of arrival, they settled on or close to ridges of moraines and hills from which they could survey the tundra both for daily food, huntable animals, and for other humans who might approach as competitors for resources or as companions with funds of knowledge. Rivers could be obstacles to mobility, but learning how to spear or net fish, they doubled food options. People had to think of nets as a tool and a concept to prepare string and to knot it into the desired pattern. Adaption, adaptation to nature and climate and making the conditions usual, usable required cooperative intelligence. This seems to have been lost among some politicians of our present world. In another subcontinent, millennia earlier, others had migrated into tropical and subtropical lands. Their descendants, when turning to look back, realized that rising water levels due to glacial glaciers melting thousands of miles away had made their Sunda mainlands into islands, a cluster ranging to Sumatra, Java, and beyond. Forward-looking and analyzing winds and waves, they understood that far off other islands existed and might be of interest. Water was their environment, and they taught themselves to understand routes on the seas to destinations beyond a particular waterscape in sight. In all these cases, the time scale was millennia, which implies that migration was a very cautious exploration of nearby options, involved moves often merely of a few kilometers in each generation, but people kept moving. Those in the Southeast Asian islands that I just talked about had unknowingly moved into a tectonic friction zone. In contrast to ice shields, eruptions of volcanoes came sudden and were, except for the lava and ash layers, short term. The geological event changed nature as habitat and could involve climate change. The eruption of Mount Toba in Indonesia about 74,000 years ago seems to have caused a six-year-long cold snap. Six years seems to be a short period, a snap. But it was a quarter of human life if we assume generations of 25 years on average. However, humans, or some of them, survived as archaeological finds of tools below and above the ash cover show. Did people flee? Where to? Ash has covered much of Southeast East and South Asia. Multi-year poor harvest experienced by one group were also experienced by all known neighboring groups. The eruption of the Thera Zantonin in island volcano in the Aegean Sea, about 1,600 before our counting, began with earth and sea quakes, giving warning and thus time to flee. Then the island had to be repopulated, and people living hundreds of kilometers away in the Minoan culture of Crete had to adjust. The 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora, Zumbava Island, again the Indonesian region, again led to atmospheric changes through ashes and winds. Europeans experienced a year without summer and a brutally cold winter 1816-17. It is said to have partly induced the resumption 
of transatlantic migration. However, 1815 also marked the end of more than two decades of trans-European revolutionary Napoleonic imperial reactionary dynastic warfare. An increase in migration is documented, but the causal connections remain open. But we have to keep all of them in mind. When in 1875 the volcano Axia erupted in Iceland, hundreds of families fled to Canada. They looked for a climate similar to their lives in Iceland and established their settlement with support of the Canadian government in a cold spot, Gimli, north of Lake Winnipeg. Connecting volcano eruptions, disasters, and migration seems common sense, but it is tenuous. The resilience of those hit has been underestimated. Weakened or injured people are unable to move, impoverished ones unable to pay passage or in, including passage time without income have to stay. A third natural climatic factor are multi-century swings in temperatures. The Roman Empire expanded during a favorable warm period with sufficient rain in North Africa for massive grain production and the empire had sufficient military power to appropriate for Italy in particular and the Rome ruled northern Med Mediterranean in general. Imperial migration, however, is not a mass expansion of inhabitants of the city of Rome or the Italian uh, territories. Rather, the central elite sent out armies and administrators, both highly competent in establishing rule and creating infrastructures and created a ruling diaspora cooperating in most annexed or conquered regions with resident elites. Thinly spread, powerful men and families have usually not been discussed in terms of diaspora, since political historians depicted empires as contiguous territories and contiguous realms of power. However, the states and Romans were as thinly spread as were subsequently stateless Jewish migrants and refugees from annexation, as well as a Jewish sect that came to be called Christian. In the latter two causes, we might speak of a natural social disaster-induced migration. Just before the Roman annexation, earthquakes and drought had made life difficult for residents who already chafed under a priestly dynastic rule. The settled Jewish and in-migrating Roman elites cooperated to deprive small farming families of land. In Jewish, but not in Roman religion, land was owned by God. Many flocked to listen to a preacher who, according to the accounts, fed them with bread, fish, and wine. Thus. Short-term local natural disasters combined with social religious structure and imperial imposition uh, to create a potential for outmigration and revolt. While the Mediterranean warm period held, climatic deterioration south of the Baltic Sea induced or forced people liv living there from the third century on to migrate to more hospitable regions. Some, like Bavarians and Langobards, and these are of course later names, moved southward. Others, like the Goths, at first eastward. These migrations have been called Völkerwanderungen in German, or Bavarian people's migrations. However, people with, people with no concept at the time associated groups who decided uh, with whom to associate and how, how to arrange a living. Associated groups around a leadership core migrated. Since, like all migrants, they could not feed themselves through agriculture, agriculture is an intelligent, knowledgeable way of usage of natural resources over time. They took food from residents along the routes. Those robbed 
either had to try to survive to next spring's sowing and to fall harvest or join the well-armed migrant associations and move on. The initial goal to seek better living conditions in the frame of climate deterioration led to expropriation of settled agricultural families along the route who had to move because of warrior human induced deterioration of chances for survival. The mobile associations might be called climate refugees. Similarly, for steppe peoples two millennia earlier and Magyars from east of the Ural Mountains 500 years later, inclement climatic conditions induced outmigration. The first seemingly ended the lower Danubian Black Sea caches, the latter intruded into settled regions further west. Another decade long cold, several decade long cold and wet era began in Europe after 1300. Some with special funds of knowledge migrated. In our language, wine and food growing moved southward, but wine and food growing never moves without the people knowing to do this moving. By the mid 1340s, people were famished and weakened. In 1348-49, the bubonic plague, deadly in itself, hit population with climate-induced low resilience to sickness. One third died. We now turn to my second subject, human-induced dis disasters in natural contexts. Forces of climate, geology, and nature, <coughs> nature in a more narrow sense will be were beyond human control, and by implication, human beings were absolved of responsibility. However, political, social, economic elites, magnates, as we call them in modern historiography, could deprive the vast majority of their subjects of access to natural resources, not to talk about equal, ac equal access. After the adverse weather conditions in the first half of the 14th century and the plague in mid-century, warfare seems to have increased because magnates competed far more intensely about the surviving, laboring, and tithe and other dues-paying subject. Note in the accepted connotation of the discourse. What is, due, what is due, that's the connotation of the language, uh, has, has to be paid automatically. But at one point, some people decided, at an earlier point in time, that payments had to be levied. Those forced to pay may not have considered them due. And serfs may have used natural resources different from free peasants. One common example of reallocation of a segment of nature are woods. The Roman imperial elites had needed vast commercial and military fleets. The result to the present day is a dry cast with no more than shrubs along the Dalmatian coast and deep into the interior. When in the Middle Ages of a European periodization, of course, magnates reserved woods for the hunt, as they called it, as home for deer and other animals, whose antlers would, after their killing, serve as signs of masculinity. Rural families lost part of the, their food resources. Human homes became more difficult to sustain. Some attempted to migrate, but this was difficult, given that the magnates had made them unfree. Those migrating eastward from parts of the central European German language region intended to live with reduced burdens. The magnates attracting them uh, to the east offered better conditions. One of the results, the consequences of which were not understood at the time, was further deforestation. Imagination of clearing woods for a settlement and of cultivating the cleared land is according to our language socialized. The population in Europe almost doubled from 38.5 million to 73.5 million. That's the data by Russell, which we always cite. 
the four years of the additional 35 million individuals, perhaps 7 million families, had chopped down, let's just say, for argument's sake, 20 trees per family. 20 trees would amount only to a very, very small plot to till. Added up, this means a total of 140 million trees cut down. This is not part of either historical narratives, not even to mention the dumb master narratives, nor of imagination. Quantity can defy imagination, but nature often is quantity. In all sources of the, of the globe, magnets fought wars over natural resources. Minerals, pastures, woods, territories, as they called them, and over the human labor to extract harvests or ores. Warfare, meaning the move of masses of soldiers that needed to be fed along the way, left path of destruction. Intermagnate warfare in medieval Europe was not chivalric fight, but destruction of the small holes. Again, imagery is local, but the activity was widespread. I'm presently researching the medieval history of the Salzburg Church province, extending at that time from South Tyrol to Slovenia and in the north from Passau on the Danube to the western edge of the Pannonian Plain. That's where Vienna is now located. The archbishops fought endless, often only small wars, but multiplied this by the number of bishops and archbishops in Europe, refugees, or refugee or survival migrations resulted. As to worldly magnates, for castles, fortification, palaces, workers had to cut down whole woods so that local rural people had no resource material for houses, for baskets and furniture, for building huts and sheds. Migration in consequence of resource deprivation is difficult to ascertain. One noble that's an interesting term in itself, a noble family, later called the Habsburgs, drove the peasants at their first castle off. This is documented. They had to roam the, mo the woods in voluntary mobility, not goal-directed migration. All of this has been known, but is not part of historians' storytelling, as Thomas was mentioning in the beginning. The climatic in impact of another small migration has only very recently been researched. The few hundreds or maybe thousands of Europeans crossing the Atlantic in and immediately after 1492 reached densely settled regions. They unwittingly carried germs and wittingly worked people to death. Three generations later, the many resident cultural groups had been annihilated. Population declined by 90% or more in early Holocaust and human history. This meant that vast cultural areas became wild nature again. It's another question to our languages. Why is nature wild? This had consequences for the global climate, perhaps inducing the so-called Little Ice Age. The argument is certainly, in my opinion, still very open to debate, but the underlying data are plausible. Annihilation of about 10% of the world's population living in 1500 cannot be grasped to its full extent by discussing the human disaster. The climate, the nature has to be added. I have, at the beginning, emphasized spiritualities connected to environmental human change. The powers which or whom South Americans venerated had not been able to protect them. The in-migrating adherents of a Christian god discussed the reach of their god. If he had not endowed the residents of the Americas with a soul, many argued, they could not be human. They could be part of nature, but not human. Or if they were human, then they were primitive primitive and needed guidance and hard work on further impact on the climate, plantation, monocultures. Humans 
in particular those in elite positions, have been able throughout history to com command cultivation and destructions, remodeling and renaturalization of landscapes as consequences for mesoregional climates and migrations. The language juxtaposition of culture and cultivated to nature and natural wild forces forces us to imbibe this when we learn to speak. We need to question it. Now you move to my third topic, exhaustion of natural resources through population growth. We'll again move to another part of the globe, uh, the overuse of natural resources uh, in the intensely tilled core region of rural, of eastern emperors, the region of the Yellow River or Huanghe, where millions of peasant families called Han Chinese but of many birthing environments and cultures of socialization, use soils because of the growing numbers so intensely that they depleted nutrients. Information by mobile people about better soils and thus better living induced them from about 700 hour counting to migrate long distance to the plains of the Yangtze River estuary. In the process of finding a nourishing landscape, they moved an empire. Resettled, they cultivated their and their elites food crops, but after a few generations, tillable land became insufficient again. Their grandchildren had to undertake short distance migrations up the hillsides. They terraced them and dug canals to water them. Being able to make water serve human needs. In the German language is called Wasserkunst, the art to harness the flow of water for usage. The Yangtze hill farming families adopt different seeds of rice carried by far traveling traders and food wise scholars from distant but connected ecologies. On hills, growing seasons are often shorter, temperatures are cooler than in marshes. Merchants who traveled to sell the surplus crops, left footprints which coalesced into paths and with huge usage of pack animals and carts into roads. These might follow the contours of elevations since carrying of goods uphill requires additional effort, though in some environments a few hundred meters in altitude may have been pre preferable to several kilometers of travel necessary to circumvent the elevation. Again, the sum of many agencies to feed themselves and their children had unintended consequences. The migrants who reached the Yangtze and cultivated in it from 700 common era on would not have imagined that 1,300 years later, in a more human chronology 40 to 50 generations later, the vastly increased number of their descendants would build the Three Gorges Dam upstream. The huge body of water being established would change the regional climate. The farming families in another, in again another region, Transcaspia, are presently facing the consequences of overuse of water for cotton monoculture over several decades, basically from the 1930s. They are actively shrinking the Caspian and Aral seas. We might also ask whether the combination of mono and culture is analytical tenable. We'll now move to microregions. Um, basically, in much of our research, uh, not only in large natural climate, research, but in the research of human lives, we have to discern the macro regions from meso regions and micro regions. And in these micro regions, humans really develop their lives in connection with neighboring micro, uh, micro regions. Across the world, as well as in each micro region of it, men and women over generations changed nature 
given environments, as we would say. But the given is a process. The fields and meadows of many parts of Europe, terrace slopes and steep hillsides in Malaysia and China, level rice paddies in Japan are the creation of humans. Even savanna bush growths in sub-Saharan Africa is quote unquote human since their cows graze while goats nibble short spring shoots and prevent uh, bushes from growing higher. Agri and horticultural landscapes last long. Compare this to the duration of imposed borders and castles. Building the latter consumes resources but does not produce or regenerate. The border between Mexico and the US used to be a line drawn in sand. Structures of rule and border and political borders have often been ephemer <coughs> ephemeral impositions even if anchored into a landscape by government called infrastructural migrant workers, whether these built the Chinese wall, the Iron Curtain, or the US fence against Mexicans and Central Americans. Even in politics with long-lasting dynasties, the, terra the terraces on hill and mountainsides outlasted emperors and political epochs. Why do historians not talk about long-lasting dynasties or achievements of peasants? Usage as in the Yellow River agriculture could easily turn into overusage and destruction. As example, I will again draw on the Salzburg Alpine mountain region. In two valleys, gold was found in the first half of the 14th century and mined intensively from the 1420s to the 1560s. Land use scape turned into mine use scape. Woods were reserved for mining, sociologically for the mine, mining entrepreneurs who needed masses of charcoal for smeltering. Within three generations after the intensification of mining, three quarters of all wood in the two valleys had been felled. The remaining quarter was expected to last for another 25 years. The combined number of trees in both valleys had originally amounted to perhaps 1.4 million. The combined population of both valleys at its high points, even at its high points, never surpassed 15,000 men, women, and children. The transport of wood to shaft entries and smeltering works was a feat of human ingenuity. For peasant families, it re the result was disaster. In winter, avalanches increased during spring and fall rain, uh, rains erosion. During the Little Ice Age, glaciers covered the entrances of high altitude mines. Peasant folk tales had God punish the miners. Whether these were guilty and haughty or not, they had to outmigrate. Empirically, the ores had been exhausted before the onset of the Little Ice Age. Topographically, the miners of South Jobs migrated to similar geologies and topographies. At different points in time, some of the descendants were sent to mine in Venezuela or migrate to mine in Australia. The processes in this specific mining uh, process may easily be transferred to regions worldwide. The Potosi silver mines, for example, for forced labor, meter of whole villages changed village agriculture under Spanish rule. Fields unintended for a year revert to, to less human culture. Such reverting it assumes a progressive viewpoint of historians with no, never duplication of previous nature. Different pla plants and trees quote unquote, remigrate at different speeds and compete for soil and light. This has been researched for the post-glacial replantation and reforestations, and in the present, we are talking about 
resource extraction manual regions in particular, the most damaging of all seem to be the uh, Alberta oil sands extraction in Canada. Let me turn to my conclusion. The interactions between nature and humans involve processes of perceiving and appropriating, of understanding and doing, of interpreting and creating. Migrants, whether short or long distance, have a particularly active role in both imprinting routes towards locations of natural resources and carrying knowledges, human resources, from one environment to another. When among the sedentary, more children, additional mouth, had to be fed, those undernourished had to move short distance to cultivate more difficult to till environments, whether wet marshes or sloping hillsides or rocky soils. The physical worlds in which humanity lives at the beginning of the 21st century has been made and remade and remade by agricultural families to which over five millennia urban ones have added the impact. When in the present, some, among whom I count myself, for good reason deplore the cutting of Indonesian, Malaysian, or Amazon forests, they might remember that you, Europe is once forested and that the cutting down of the woods is still being considered a cultural achievement. It was in a way. One continent to the west the taming of the American wilderness as a process, the ideological construct came much later, is also considered a constructive achievement. All of these regions, as large as London, or as small as Lodz, or as far, as e or as far east as Har Harbin, had in migrating labor populations of more than 50% of the total inhabitants. Chicago did not exist in 1800, Hong Kong was a few fishing villages before 1850. All migrants had to come to terms as well as to create their environments or those their masters, bosses, magnates wanted. In the Atlantic migration system, men and women, women did not go to America, but in search of, in Italian, pane e lavoro, bread and work. Between 1870 and 1921, from Italy's many regions alone, 16.6 million men and women left. And Zachlebem, for bread, in Polish, between 1880 and 1940, approximately 10 million from po left from Poland alone. They still occupied Poland. In the North China Manchuria migration, men and women went in search of land and soon work in mines. To view migration, or for that matter, sedentariness and environment separately, or to look at mere political regimes, colonizer expansions, or industrial investment regimes makes no sense. <coughs> like environmental historiography, imperial studies have emphasized this, as least some authors have since the 1980s. Earlier, the French school of the Annales pointed to long durée developments in environmental contexts. A combined history of ecology and migration would probably, at least in a shorter range for the last few centuries, be served by sources like technical manuals for food and industrial crops, for agricultural and monoplantation management. The imagery of cultivating virgin soils has influenced national identity construct, but is absolutely useless for analyses. The American prairies, Canadian plains, South Russian black soil regions, or Argentine pampas, and the rearm of grasses that any newcoming family considered a massive hindrance to cultivation of food crops. The natural was the enemy of food on the table, the cultural. Migrants' interests lay in turning whatever natural environment they found into a life chance providing ecology, and they hoped that their kids would still be able to live in that ecology. Planning life courses and implementing the plans might also be considered natural or is it cultural? It's mixed. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Herder. Uh, here's a small token of our gratitude. Uh, uh, now we have a chance of approximately 10-15 minutes. It's time for um, a discussion. So, uh, and please use then this mic. So, um, any questions? Okay, um, I could ask the first one myself. So, uh, there's one key issue that you uh, didn't bring up uh, in your presentation, that is the, the number of how many human beings there are on this planet. So, if I would just like to ask you to reflect on this issue, because as we know, uh, there are more and more of us around. So, um, obviously, in a way, the let's say, the, the, either the impacts of humans on, on their environment or the impact of uh, natural events on humans uh, was at least somehow in scale different or what would you, what would you say? That's a, difficult, pardon, yeah. That's a difficult question. But when I said at one point that nature often is quantity, talking about words or other things, I knew when I said that, that I had not mentioned that human beings is also quantity. Um, we, we have talked, scholars have talked about the carrying capacity of the earth. But they have done so for long and so far it has been able to extend the carrying capacity and for a long time in a way that nature seemingly is not permanently damaged, because nature always adjusts. It's not like an industry where you have a machine that doesn't adjust, nature adjusts, and human beings have again to deal with this. Uh, I do share a certain concern for the quantity of human beings at the moment. And um, in my opinion, the declining number of children per couple uh, to below a regeneration point under two children per couple uh, may be changing this in the future, but we have large parts of the globe where the population still is massively increasing. And, and in a way, these parts of the globe that we call in our language underdeveloped or more positively on the way to development are exploited the human resources and the natural ones by us who live in the developing parts of the world. So the human growth and the capability to feed all of them is an issue that concerns all of us and I have no clear answer but it is one that needs to concern us and so in this one example that uh, originally Perhaps a few million settlers came into the Yangtze Valley. Then they had to move up the hills. And now by now have this huge man-made dam shows to what degree quantity imposes itself on nature. So, Dirk, thank you for that fascinating um, uh, presentation. You, you mentioned at one point about the movement of um, the wine-growing frontier northwards. Mm -hmm. And as an aside, said that it didn't just move on its own, people had to move with it. Um, I think we're witnessing a new, new movement of the wine-growing frontier right now. I, I know from where I've lived for some time in southeast England, um, there is a growth of vineyards, um, there is a talk of the region of southeast England becoming the new champagne and certainly produces very good uh, sparkling wine. Um, but if we look at that, that, that doesn't involve the movement of people from Champagne or from France or elsewhere. It involves a... Um, a a, a, an adaptation in agriculture locally in southeast England where um, partly farmers who are already there are turning to wine and partly other 
British people are coming into wine growing as they perceive that the climatic conditions are right. Although, of course, they are often drawing on uh, elite technical advice in order to set up and run those vineyards where they are indeed drawing on French and, and other expertise. So I wondered whether there is any evidence from the historical record around the movement of agricultural frontiers in this way as to whether it actually involves movement of people or whether it is the kind of uh, adaptation and learning of new skills by people who were already in the places that the frontier is moving to. Um, the way I see it, this, it has in the past always been both. In the present, there's so much information flow that people do not necessarily need to migrate. If you think in terms of the cold period in the early 14th century, there were, uh, practical, there were no printed texts, there's very little in writing, but you needed to have the knowledges. In particular, in wine growing, you kind of had needed them at your fingertips because you, uh, mowing grains is very different from pruning wines. So there is expertise that needed to be transferred. Um, historians, again another type, I, I've made it clear that I don't like the political historians. The same goes for the church historians. The church historians have monks move and knowledge has traveled from monasteries to monasteries. This is not wrong, but monks in all Middle Ages belonged to the aristocracy and would not work for themselves. So at least it was lay brothers, peasants with knowledge as they settled. They sent wine growing experts into regions that they wanted to cultivate. So there is a mobility of people with the actual funds of knowledge. Um, how large it was, we cannot determine. We, 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 we're pretty certain that not whole populations moved. It's not like the miscalled people's migrations, the large associated groups. But wherever knowledges were transferred, people usually moved at the time uh, before printing. After printing, we have to sort of consider to what degree print changed this, but even the first prints, the printing was in urban centers and it was spread by migrating uh, sellers of these little tracts, broad, broads. So there's an immense amount of mobility associated with it, but not of all, all populations. Uh, thank you. I will ask one more question, and after that we shall have a, a brief break and continue at... Uh, when, uh, 10 uh, 45. Now, uh, something uh, that catched my ear when you were giving your presentation was that uh, I don't recall exactly what you were referring to, but you mentioned that, that actually people moved relatively short distances, but when you add time into that, it's sort of the expansion of humans uh, across places becomes more, more and more evident. Now, Maybe in anticipation of our later debates today, I would like to ask you a question that, you know, we as professionals working in this field, we uh, might have a tendency to overemphasize certain aspects related to human migration. And if we then take a look at contemporary debates that are hovering especially around this very topic that we are talking today, you know, climate change, a lot of people moving, you know, millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people moving, sort of uh, that type of thing. So I would like to uh, ask you as someone who has been looking at this from a very broad perspective over across time and societies, so about the impact of migration, you know. Uh, do we overemphasize it? You know, how important is it uh, uh, usually... Uh, can we actually say anything general about it? You know, creating change maybe in, in, in our societies and in, in the way we live. So, uh, this broad topic, so uh, what do you think? I don't think we are overemphasizing it, but we are just one part of a broader uh, group of historians who work. Um, sedentary people 
change environment as much as migrants do, but migrants carry additional knowledges with them. And I don't see the, no, or no longer see the uh, distinction between sedentary people and migrants as much. If you think of the about 55, 60 million Europeans who left Europe uh, because it was an ecological disaster zone for many of them uh, in the 19th century and uh, beyond. They made their decisions within families. If we count families as four or five, that's 200 million, two uh, three quarters of them sedentary who are involved in this migration decision making. Um, those who arrive somewhere are kind of jumping onto a moving train, which is a very technical image now, um, because the societies are evolving constantly. And in my opinion, our capabilities to show graphically that the society of socialization and departure is moving and the society in which people uh, my, uh, migrate is moving, it's very difficult to envision mentally because we look at societies at mental stops at certain points in time and cannot fully grasp the dynamics. But yes, sedentary people do change migrants because they, they have double the options. They bring all the knowledges they acquire they come into societies which have different knowledges. They will have to discard some of them because they're no longer applicable, but they add. I once taught in, in Paris in one of the suburbs, and French people are very proud of their language. My students had three languages fluently. Their home language, French, and I taught in English. They had far more human capabilities than those French who were so proud of their culture. And they're ju people are justifiably proud of their culture. Uh, there's no problem with that, but we need to see this additional impact that comes from migration, and I think we're justified in emphasizing.